afternoon. Um, in this session, I'm going to talk about scaling messaging horizontally for the cloud. Oops, nearly lost my laptop. So this is me, my name is Rob Davies, I work for Red Hat, I'm, a, I'm the Director of Technology for XPaaS. XPaaS is any of the middleware products that we're actually putting onto our, our PaaS platform, and for Red Hat that's OpenShift. So we're focused really on providing a really good environment for people to not only develop, but also deploy apps into cloud-based environments. Um, I've been working on large-scale projects, uh, both as someone who's developed products and projects in open source, but also on the other side of the house, I've been a consumer of uh, products too. But I actually started off really as um, a systems architect for a big telco in the UK, um, then went to finance, etc. I'm a co-author of ActiveMQ in Action, so I know ActiveMQ fairly well, and um, I'm also one of the uh, contributors to the Apache ActiveMQ project. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to do a quick overview of Fabricate again. Um, James talked a lot about Fabricate this morning at the keynote, but I, I think it'd be worth talking, just giving you a quick summary of Fabric, Fabricate again. Then I'm going to talk about enterprise messaging and actually what that means. So you probably already know what enterprise messaging is. When you come to the slides, um, you realise the only reason I want to talk about enterprise messaging again is because I spent a long time on making these dynamic slides just move around, so I don't have any excuse to show them off. Then I'm going to introduce Fabricate MQ, um, and I'm also going to talk about why we need something like Fabricate MQ. I'll explain as well, it's not actually another message broker, it's actually a smart message router. So it's not actually doing any of the hard work a message broker would do, but it's actually been a proxy for messaging going through it. And I explain why we need to do it that way as well. And then at the end, I'll do a demonstration of Fabricate MQ and, and what it's capable of doing on top of Fabricate. So again, Fabricate, uh, it's an open source project. You can find it at fabricate.io. Um, it lives at GitHub, it's Apache licensed. And actually, if you look at what it tries to do, um, it's laid on top of Kubernetes. And Kubernetes itself can be deployed on all these platforms at the bottom. Uh, as James has already explained, Kubernetes, well, it's just over a year old. 1.0 Kubernetes isn't even out yet. There's a launch party for Kubernetes in Portland in July, I think it's 21st of July. So that's going to be 1.0 when that gets released. But Kubernetes really changes for everything um, for how you deploy and orchestrate Docker containers. And because it's come out of Google, there's a lot of trust actually in the Kubernetes project. Google have got over 20, about 20 years experience in developing cloud-based platforms and we trust they know what they're doing. So we, we have um, developed Fabricate to sit on top of Kubernetes. And I really apologize for this horrible diagram. I was just going through the slides again and looking at it, and it's, it's as ugly as hell. You hear every single branch on the ugly tree when I was making, putting it together. Um, but at the bottom, we have the management aspects that we lay on top of Kubernetes for centralized logging, for metrics, and for deep application management. So we can actually hop into an application I'm mean, going to look and see what's inside it. If, if it's Java and it's running JMX, you can expose that. And I'll show you some of that in the demonstration at the end of this, this talk. The next layer of that is, is really important. In fact, it's probably the most important bit of Fabricate right now. And that's the continuous delivery component of it. So if you're developing microservices and you want to deploy them onto a cloud environment, actually the best thing to do is to have that automated. So when you're testing, you're developing, moving stuff into production, you, it's important to have the right tools in place to make that really easy to do. And then the top layer is um, iPaaS, Integration Platform as a Service. This is a term which is coined by, by Gartner. And it really describes an integration platform uh, and the components of it um, for integration in cloud environments. Um, everyone's moving to the cloud, or so we think. Um, in fact, 
a lot of people are moving to the cloud yet, they're just thinking about it. But if you look at the, the applications which are out there, you'll see there's a lot of um, SaaS applications, um, software as a service applications. Things like Salesforce is, is a really good example. So you also need to be able to deploy and integrate with that and your on-premise um, apps too. You need the right kind of infrastructure. You need it to be flexible. It needs to be able to support microservices off of that. And straight after my session, this session now, Klaus is going to be talking about Camel and how that's going to be deployed as a microservice on, on Fabricate. So I'd definitely stick around for that. Uh, we also deploy an API registry. The API registry itself uses Kubernetes to go um, to do a lookup to find all the services which you're running on your, your platform. So it does that at runtime and builds up the registry so you can go and explore and, um, and look at all the APIs which are running on your platform. And then there's API Man, which is the API management component. Now, API management is, is, is important if you want to control access to your, um, your APIs. And in fact, um, if you're exposing public APIs, then the ability to secure the API and then to set policies on those APIs is important. So you can do things like you can set rate limits, how many times an API can be called by a certain group of customers, for example. Um, and you can have different qualities of service behind that API based on policies that you set. API Man is a, is a relatively new project and is part of the Fabricate family. Okay, so let me introduce you to enterprise messaging and the awesome slides which do dynamic things like this. So why would you want to use messaging? Um, well, it's robustness to change. Uh, it's the timing dependence. Um, by timing dependence, I mean that you don't actually have to have all your applications up at the same time when you're communicating. So it's asynchronous. You can fire messages off onto a queue, and then you can have a consuming application which would spin up later and then consume those messages. It doesn't have to be around at the same time. It's event-driven. And if uh, you've seen the Vertex talk this morning, which is really good, uh, event-driven architects, architectures are, are important scale. So messaging helps things scale really well. I mean it's platform and language independent so that means you can communicate with other platforms, other languages, so you're not restricted to just Java or running on a Windows box or a Mac. You can talk to unlinking different applications. So you might have a .NET application which wants to talk to say a mobile phone uh, over MQTT for example. And messaging is very good for that. So enterprise message brokers um, are, des oops, are designed to support many different messaging patterns. They're typically highly available, they support clustering, and they support store and forward. So store and forward is great for wide area networks um, where you want to store messages locally on a broker, which may be in your own data center. But actually you want to communicate with a remote data center, which might be in a different continent or another country. And store and forward is a, a very secure way of, of doing that. But actually, when you set up these configurations, they're, they're fairly static. So I'm going to be talking a lot about ActiveMQ. And in fact, Fabricate MQ, Smart Proxy, actually relies on ActiveMQ at the back end. And ActiveMQ is an Apache project. Uh, it's been around for 10 years. Um, and it's been at, at the Apache Software Found since about 2006. It was actually created at, uh, at Codehouse um, before it moved to the Apache Software Foundation. It supports Java and C++ and .NET clients and supports MQP, MQTT, STOMP and lots of different wild protocols. So it's really easy to actually join up an MQTT device, something like an Arduino, and have it talking to a Java application over a queue or top of and it's embedded, it's embedded in a lot of applications. Um, and uh, you can either run it either embedded or deployed standalone or clustered or networked together. So some of the basics behind messaging is we, we talk over channels. And actually a, a channel is just, um, it's just a name communication pipe. And, but there are different styles of, of channels. You can uh, have point to point, publish, subscribe. Point to point is where you send one message. Um, one consumer gets it and you publish, subscribe. 
if you send a message and everybody listening on that particular channel will get that message. But there's different other things that messaging does as well. Um, so this is an example of a, a destinations. So the producer's just sending that message. I'll show it again because it, it took ages to do this slide. So this producer's just talking to a destination called Order and actually only the consumer on that destination is going to get the, that, that particular message. And then there's things like you can do message routing based on selectors. Selectors on the headers of the messages. So if you send a message and you, um, this is demonstrating just selecting based on the, of the property of the colour of the message, you can be quite distinct about how you select messages inside a message channel. And then we also support wildcards as well. Um, um, we support uh, like two different types of wildcards. A star matches everything after it. Um, sorry, everything in an element. And the greater than matches everything in the subtree. So this is an example of someone uh, consuming <coughs> messages, and it's actually in a bar. So you can have consuming wants to have all, everything which comes from a bar he wants to <coughs> drink. Someone who only wants to consume any alcohol which is white, be that beer or wine. And then the next one down is here he wants to have white wine, it's, it's quite a connoisseur. And the one at the bottom just, just likes lager. So when you say messages to it, it's very prescriptive. The guy at the top is going to get everything. And um, the guy at the bottom is going to get that white beer. But when I send the, the wine, the guy at the top will get everything. The second guy will get it because it's white and the guy consuming the wine will get it. So that's, that's kind of like wild cards. And another important aspect of, of messaging um, is message groups. Message groups aren't in the JMS 1.1 standard, but um, they, they are in nearly every message broker which has been created, either commercial or, or open source. A message groups really is a way of being able to have queues within queues. So you actually set up a message group like that, you actually specify a JMX group ID, and then any messages which are, are tagged with that particular property, oops, will get that message. So if you look at high availability, um, and I'm covering high availability in particular, and networking, because I would really want to demonstrate that ActiveMQ, as it stands today, out of the box, isn't well suited for dynamic cloud environments. So ActiveMQ supports high availability with um, a concept called uh, master-slave. And, in, and that, what happens when you run a master-slave cluster, you can have as many slaves as you like, but the first broker which comes up will grab a lock, either on a file system, um, so if you could use it on an FS, or if it's, um, because ActiveMQ supports many different message stores, it could be uh, like a relational database, it would grab a lock in the relational database and the first broker which grabs that lock will then become the master. Any other brokers you run up after that master will become slaves and they'll just continue to try and pull and grab the lock. So if the master goes away, the slave will be able to take over and become the master. It's great, it's highly available. However, it does mean you're only going to have one broker running at one time in this particular configuration. So that means it's not going to scale particularly well. So there's this another concept called network of brokers. Just doing store and forward, and actually this is the prescriptive way of actually getting um, scaling out, some horizontal scaling of message brokers. Um, actually, James, James, could you, me, could you get me one? Cheers. Um, so networks of brokers, what I want to demonstrate here, because it's doing store and forward, if you're sending messages through, uh, through a network, the producer is going to send the message to, the, to its local broker, which is broker one. So if you follow this down, if you follow this around, because it's secure and persistent, that message will be go, would go to the store on broker one. It would send a receipt back to the producer, so it knows he's got that message. But then to get the consumer, it also has to be sent across um, a network, across a TCP IP socket. And then the broker two will then store it on its own disk. 
to send a receipt back to the original broker to say, yeah, I've got that message, it's all good. And then it would send that message over to, to the consumer. So you can see there's lots of traffic going on there. To send one message from one producer to one consumer through a network of brokers, it's highly reliable, yeah, and it's, you're gonna guarantee that message gets there. But it's actually designed for something different than scalability. It's really designed for the, the case when you've got remote locations and you want to guarantee that message is going to get there across a, a network which is unreliable. So we have examples of using ActiveMQ in remote locations for um, a big uh, bricks and mortar supermarket chain in North America. And they have locations where we've got supermarkets down in, in South America where they may be using dial-up networks or they may be using a satellite link. It's highly unreliable, but they're using ActiveMQ because it can cope with those sorts of things. But networks of brokers are great for that, but not ideal for scaling out uh, messaging. So there are limitations with networks of brokers. So I think it's, it's quite apparent performance is gonna be an issue because those messages are always stored locally. There's a lot of guarantees that the message broker provides around storing that message. All that information goes back to the producer. Networks are chatty because of that. So you're generating a lot of traffic. Um, anytime you generate traffic on a network, which is unnecessary, you're gonna hamper your overall application performance. They also, perform, they also cause bottlenecks. So you could have hundreds of clients coming into a local broker but you typically you'd only have one network to another broker. Now you can set up more than one, but you, you typically have like one, maybe two dis, um, dedicated networks to carry that traffic. So you, you've got a bit of a bottleneck there too. And because of the way um, networks work, if you have a cluster on a data center, you can have orphan messages when that broker goes down um, and comes back up again. Your consumers may have swapped over to another message broker and it's, it all get a bit hairy and your messages will get stuck on one particular broker. Uh, but the worst bit is when you configure a network of brokers, it's kind of like it's static. Um, you have to be quite prescriptive about how you connect things together. There's a lot of configuration with ActiveMQ. It's really flexible. Um, but you actually have to configure a network, which is just two brokers, slightly differently to one which has got three brokers in. I mean, if you're using topics and queues, or just topics, you'll probably configure it completely differently again to as you would if you're just using queues. Or if you had four brokers, you'd have to change configuration again. So networks are static. So I don't know, okay, I'm not sure this translates very well, but in England, or the UK, and I think it's mainly England, People drive around when, when we go camping. So if you go camping, yeah? Uh, in England, there's these people like caravans. So instead of just going camping, they have these metal trailers they carry around on the back of the cars and they go somewhere. But they've extended that even further. You've got these static caravans. So they're like a normal caravan, but they stick it up somewhere they want to go all the time, like near the seaside, on the coast. And then they, it's actually based on bricks. You can't move it. But active in queues like that, once you set it up, it's, it's very hard to make it flexible. It's not going to change, it's just going to be static. So if you look at active in queue and what it actually has, it's got um, a lot of flexibility being built in around that core. So it started off really being designed to be fast. Um, and it is relatively fast as a message broker, but you're just using it to store messages. But it's also got extremely flexible. There's a lot of flexibility built into ActiveMQ. You can do a lot of things with it. I mean, you can embed Camel in it, for example, but beyond that, there are plugins you can plug into ActiveMQ um, for specific things like security. If you want to add certain headers onto messages to say come in, um, you can do that. Uh, people have written plugins so you can actually set the timestamp for the message when it comes into the broker. You set it in the broker instead of being sent on the client so you get a consistent view of when messages arrived at that broker. Then there's all the different protocols it supports. And each protocol, as it comes in, has to be converted into a format that ActiveMQ really understands. And internally inside ActiveMQ, that's OpenWire. 
So if you've got a stop message or an AMQP message, Active MQ will be spending a lot of CPU cycles actually taking that message in and converting it into a format he understands. Then there's lots of threads. There are lots and lots of threads being used by Active MQ all the time. Um, and we know lots and lots of threads are really, really bad. There's lots of context switches, there's lots of synchronization points. It's, it's, it's the opposite of vertex, really. It's the anti-vertex message broker. So if we had um, a way to remove all the crud, I mean, all the bits we don't really need around Active MQ, and just focused on the message routing, we could get the best performance we could out of Active MQ. Active MQ as it stands. So what do we need for messaging in on cloud-based deployments? What, what are we actually looking for? We're actually looking to be able to support thousands and thousands of clients. You want the flexibility to be able to spin up brokers on demand. So when you've got more demand, you want to be able to spin up more brokers and have them running to handle the traffic coming through. But when the traffic's not there, when the demand isn't there, you don't want an active MQ broker just sitting around waiting for things to happen. So it needs to be able to scale down as well. And client connections need to be multiplexed. There is an upper limit really for our active MQ because it's all based on a, it's not, it's not active MQ's fault, it's just when it was first written. The only thing you could do was blocking IO. Um, so you can do any asynchronous communication. So every single connection has at least one thread. And then internally, ActiveMQ has many threads which are running to process those messages. So it's going to be an upper limit on how many clients you can, get, you can connect to ActiveMQ. Which is why, if you could multiplex um, connections as they come in and reduce the number of connections on ActiveMQ itself, you could get much better performance. But if you can abstract out all that stuff of all the flexibilities, like camera routing, all the protocol support, abstract that out of ActiveMQ, let it just concentrate on messaging, you're going to get a really fast performance message broker. So this is why we, we built some Fabricate MQ. And Fabricate MQ is built on top of Vertex. Um, and Vertex if you didn't see the talk this morning, is multi-reactive, it's extremely lightweight. It's a pleasure to actually um, program with because it's got a really great programming model inside it. It's Polygot, it was inspired by, by Erlang and OTP. We don't use a Polygot um, application, so we're just writing in pure Java. But because it's asynchronous, it means that we can support a lot of connections coming in through Vertex. So if ActiveMQ could support 2,000 connections, Vertex could support 10 times that easily. I think, is the upper bound like 100,000 or is there an upper bound? Don't know, okay. But this is a benchmark, this is a real reason we went for Vertex because this benchmark, um, you can, you can go, go and f uh, find this at Tech Power benchmarks. Vertex is really, really fast at ha uh, handling traffic. So if we could have a process which sits in front of ActiveMQ brokers, which is using Vertex, we could actually improve performance of ActiveMQ at the back end. And that's exactly what we've done with Fabricate MQ. To explain what Fabricate MQ is actually doing, um, let's have a look and see what the, the message flow is through Fabricate MQ. So when we pick up a connection, from Vertex, so Vertex is embedded in this um, public AMQ. The first thing it's going to do is the protocol conversion. So ActiveMQ itself relies on OpenWire. So we can convert MQTT or Stomp, we're going to convert or MQP, we convert those into OpenWire so ActiveMQ doesn't have to do it. So it's got less work to do. The other thing we're going to do is uh, route it through a camel engine. And the reason we do this, you know, it's a bit camels fantastic. But the real reason um, we think this is important is because in ActiveMQ, queues are the best thing to use. Like, you should never really use topics. Um, if you want persistent messaging, just, just concentrate on using queues. However, the MQTT protocol doesn't support queues. It's all topics. 
So we can convert on the fly messages come, which have been published and subscribed by MQTT, convert those on the fly into queues, and any messages coming back out again, um, we can subscribe to those on a queue and convert those back into topics. So it's important to have camera routing in there. Then after it's gone through the camera uh, message routing, it goes through the, uh, an API management hook. So this hooks into API man, so you can apply policies. Policies about um, the rate limiting of security checks, etc. Everything which you can do with API man to uh, an API, why shouldn't you be able to do that to messaging destination too? You know, it's important to be able to maybe rate limit um, messages coming into a particular queue from a particular customer. Um, you might want to uh, attract some billing information to that for a security policy. So there's that flexibility built in. And then we've got the multiplexer. The multiplexer takes many connections in and converts that into one kind of format, one, one pipe going out. And then it splits into destination sharding where a lot of the intelligence is so we can actually scale up um, message brokers based on demand. And finally, the last bit is broker control, which decides where those messages are going to go. So, we support these protocols currently in the protocol conversion. And in the camel routing, um, there's a special component which has been written for Fabricate MQ, which does the routing. It's just called the MQ component. It's actually embedded inside the Fabricate MQ project, which is a sub project. It's one of the Subprojects of, of Fabricate. The API management, it talks to API Man. Has anyone used API Man yet or heard about it? It's a relatively new project and we've just started advertising it a bit. But if you want an open source solution for API management, I recommend going to get API Man. It's very good. And this is what the multiplex is doing. It's taking lots and lots of, of um, connections and just making sure one connection goes out to the active and key broker. And when, um, when you talk, talk about the internet things and connected devices, and, and typically Active and Q is used right now by a number of different organizations for internet things, because it supports the MQTT protocol, there could be hundreds of thousands of devices that people actually want to connect and route in through a message broker. So one Active and Q broker is not going to handle that load, unless it's multiplex first. And even then, you probably want several brokers, but the ability to do that um, and to shard that information as it comes in is, is really good. And the benefits of sharding is you can split up your destinations across multiple brokers. So it also means that you can co-locate consumers who are consuming on a particular destination with a producer which is sent into that broker. So you're not having to do those network hops. You just route all the consumers through the smart proxy, Fabricate MQ, to the right message broker with your consumer messages. And internally, we have a representation. So if I click MQ, it, it um, talks to all the message brokers, it spins up. And it builds up an internal representation in Fabric MQ. The reason it does this is so, um, if you ever looked at uh, the active MQ JMX tree, it's kind of horrible. Um, there's lots of things exposed, and we want to actually just concentrate on a few things, like the number of destinations, how deep are those destinations, i.e. how many messages are outstanding, how many consumed yet, how many connections are, are coming into a particular broker. And if we measure those things, we can get a good indication of load. And based on that indication of load, we then do something with a rules engine. So what the rules engine is doing, is embedded in ActiveMQ, and it's, um, when, when things change with a broker, like uh, we've been monitoring the load on a broker, we fire these events which go, go around and look at different aspects you can do. And there's just three basic rules at the moment. And we're going to be extending this out to make it a bit more generic. Um, these are fairly hard coded rules. Um, but it will either it will scale up if a connection limits are reached or destination limits are reached. It will scale down if it's got a message broker which is its load is less than uh, like it's 50% maximum and there's capacity to move that load to another broker. It will do that, it will scale down that message broker because we want to have as much density as possible. I, we want to utilize those brokers as much as possible within the limits we set. And then um, 
The, the other thing we do is distribute load. So if we've got a, a message broker which is under capacity, we might have to span up a new broker to, to um, cope with more load, but we will move destinations from one broker to another. Now actually, when we move um, messages around from one broker to another, you'd think it would be quite simple to do. You'd think you'd be able to just start copying messages from one broker and end up in another broker. You know, it's, it's messaging, it's, it's going to work, right? Well, unfortunately, ActiveMQ doesn't really like that. And if you start doing that automatically, yeah, ActiveMQ is going to do this. It's going to scream like a little girl because it will get these message, messages out of sequence. Um, they get these acknowledgements. Um, and it just doesn't know what to do with them. So it starts throwing errors, and so what you actually have to do when you start moving messages around, this is what Fabric A actually has to do. It first off has to work out what, what our destinations to migrate, and then it has to stop the dispatching. And all the message routing is going through Fabric A and Q, so it can stop dispatching messages to the consumers. So it will stop, uh, um, stop dispatching messages to the consumers on those destinations, and then wait for all those messages which are in flight to be acknowledged from the consumer. Then it will do the migration of the queue, it will update its internal destination map, and then it will resume processing. Now a cool bit of what, how this happens, and how we spin up brokers, how we discover where brokers are actually <laughs> running, and how we scale down brokers, is done through Kubernetes. And to explain what Kubernetes is, Again, I don't think explained to death already. Um, but Kubernetes uh, is a really lightweight orchestration engine. And it's probably best to talk about the actual model it has and what pods are and replication controllers. A pod is just um, a collection of applications which are, are going to be run together on the same node. They share the same life cycle. Typically, when we use pods for our applications, We'd have one application per pod. There are some cases, um, what has been modeled to take multiple um, containers is because sometimes you might want to co-locate, say, Tomcat and um, MongoDB or so, something like that. You want them to live and die at the same time. Pods live on nodes. Kubernetes is going to be managing the density of these nodes. So Pods don't always stay on the same node. They could be in running um, application lifetime. They could be moved from node to node many times. Because Kubernetes is going to be trying to achieve the best density it can on the infrastructure it has. And it does this through replication controllers. So replication controllers, they sit on Kubernetes master, a very small lightweight process, which actually monitor the pods it's responsible for. And if it's asked to spin up more, it will spin up more pods. But it also monitor the, the liveness of a pod. So if a pod dies, it will get automatically restarted. So straight away, we've got high availability if we were at the top of Kubernetes. So it's less of a need to have, actually there's no need to have high availability through master slaves with ActiveMQ, because Kubernetes is gonna be doing this for us. The other thing it does is um, have uh, a service which is an abstraction to, to define these logical pods. It gives it a well-known name, and so you can route to a particular service, and Kubernetes will work out the best way to route to um, the pods at the back end which are providing that service. And then to provide multi-tenancy, all your pods, replication controllers, and your services can be co-located together in one name space. Um, so Kubernetes itself can support many namespaces, um, and it's a way of doing uh, multi-tenancy. So what we do in Fabricate um, itself is we rely on Kubernetes to be there. And actually what it does is Fabricate MQ will control um, an AMQ replication controller and ask it to spin up pods containing an active MQ broker on its behalf. I mean, when they're spun up, it will constantly be monitoring those brokers to see how much load is on those brokers. So it's, it's a, a check that it, it can do to, to ensure that it, um, the broker's running has got the correct load. The reason it does that too is because you may want to have more than one fabricated MQ. You could have 10 running if you really wanted to scale out big. Um, and they'd all be looking at these AMQ brokers in the same way. So it doesn't assume it's going to be the sole controller of those brokers. There could be many more. So the other thing we do 
is uh, I mean, this is this is an overview of everything we do inside um, of Fabric AMQ. We're taking all that all that stuff, all the extra stuff that ActiveMQ provides and provided it into a smart message proxy. And then sat it on top of Vertex so we can get the scalability and the high um, performance. But probably the most important thing is what it does is provide a mechanism for independent scaling. So you can have multiple Fabricate MQ um, instances running, and they all talk to the same MQ replication controller, which can spin up at the back end many instances of Active MQ. Okay. So this is, I'm going to do a quick demo, um, and this is what I want to demonstrate to you. I'm going to demonstrate uh, MQTT devices, but I don't actually have any here, I'm going to like, simulate those. Um, talking through Fabricate MQ to consumers at the back end. And because I'm actually, this is a demo, I actually want to show, try and demonstrate active MQ brokers spinning up automatically uh, to cope with the load. Um, there are limits you can set. So when I talked about the rule engine before, um, the limits internally inside uh, Fabricate MQ are usually quite high, they're usually a couple of hundred destinations. I've set these to five destinations per broker. Okay. And let me show you some of the, the client code actually. Um, let's go to this. So on client side, on the consumer, what I've actually got is just a camel route, which is going to take messages off a, a queue. And it's using JMS. It's using the, um, the active MQ component of camel. And on the producer, I'm using a Java MQTT library to send uh, messages through Fabricate MQ. Now I'm going to run this because I'm, I'm lazy. So I'm going to, I've got a pass, I've got a Fabricate running. I'm not going to spin up lots of these things externally because I can put out our paths. But to show you how I know how to connect where Fabricate MQ is running, all I need to do is take these environment variables. Um, on this one is the service. So Fabricate MQ is the service name. So I know where it actually lives by just um, looking through this environment variable, which when this example is deployed onto Kubernetes, it's injected by Kubernetes itself. So when it deploys it, it injects defined environment variables for a service. So I just looked for that environment variable and I know exactly where the host is going to be. In a similar way, Kubernetes also injects the port for the well known port for that service into my code. So it's very simple to write applications on, on Kubernetes. And if you look down here, what I'm going to do is start sending messages periodically. Um, through every second through um, fabricating MQ. So, get this demo. Okay. So look at the services which are actually running. This is using the Fabricate console. And I have Fabricate running on my box inside um, a vagrant image. In fact, if you go to the Fabricate um, IO website, actually the, the, best, the best way to start playing around with Fabricate is to actually download um, the image, the, vagrant, the Fabricate vagrant um, image. And it's extremely easy to set up. Even I set it up on my, my Mac in a matter of minutes. It's, it's pretty easy to use. So you'll see here, um, I've got the Fabricate um, service running. And if I look at the controllers, these are the replication controllers, controls for pods. You'll notice as well, I've got a, an AMQ broker. I don't have a service for that because I don't want to expose that to service. I want to control all the communication going into AMQ, the AMQ brokers via Fabricate MQ. So I don't expose that to service. Fabricate MQ, when it gets deployed, it also gets deployed along with um, the ActiveMQ message broker. <coughs> so I've got the consumer I just uh, 
showed you already deployed on here. So I'll start that, that running first. And I'll start the producers. I'm going to be sending messages every second. So that's going to start. So if I actually go and look at the pod where the consumer's running, and this is the pod here, you notice the little arrow here. This enables me. This is this um, the Hot Air console, um, and enables this particular arrow when Fabricate detects that a container or pod which is running is exposing um, information uh, over Jalokia. So this container, it's running, it's a Java program, it's running Camel, it's exposing JMX over Jalokia. So I can go into, oops, I could go straight into this, um, into the, the, the running container, and then look and see what's actually running on here. You can see I'm actually on, on the consumer I've set up, it's actually listening to five different destinations which are running. And it's this is the count it's taken in, how many messages it's taken in. Remember the producers, which are, and I'm always say sending to five destinations, are sending messages pretty slowly so you can actually see these coming in, which is kind of cute. So, I've got the limit set up on Fabric AMQ for uh, 10 destinations. So if I go back to the controller, I'll increase the producers, I'll set another one running off, up, which should actually take it up to like the limit, it can go up to um, the fabricating queue before it starts to do things. And that's, okay, so it's going to be running there like pretty, quite heavily. I took it up to three, so now I've got 15 destinations, it's destination for the pod. 15 destinations going through Fabricate MQ. And you should see at some point um, the MQ broker will spin up another broker to take account of that load. And my indication there at the top, I don't know if you saw at the top, but it just kicked off another broker. So we've got to look at the pods. We can look and see how those destinations have been kind of distributed. And you can see now we've got a specific range of destinations on this particular broker. Go back again and look at the, the second one. This is the oldest one. This has got all of, you see, it's still got the destinations for, for like a lot of the messages there. Where it's zero, the Q size is zero, where these most messages have actually been migrated across to a second message. And we can actually go a bit crazy and spin up quite a few of these. And this is, this is how easy Fabricate makes it to actually test out systems like this. So I'll push it up to, to 10. And we'll see how crazy um, Fabricate gets. Now, I've never done this before, so I've no idea what's going to happen. I don't know if you can see down the bottom, but it's slowly spinning up more MQTT producers. Uh, we're on six at the moment. Got up to nine. We'll wait a bit, fabricate MQ is just probably um, working very hard in the background, trying to move things around and we we'll see if it spins up more than two message brokers. I think you can handle the load. So anyway, that's the end of uh, the demo. <laughs> Moving swiftly on. Uh, let's see. 
So, any questions? <laughs> Done? Cool. Excellent. Thank you.